Dead, let's jump into our uh, lesson today. For the last few weeks, we've been studying some of the ways that we as Christians can love Jesus, love each other, love our neighbors better. And we've discussed the fact that God is the foundation of love, not you, not me. You know, we're not, we don't decide what love is and isn't. We grope for whatever we want. Jesus is the definition of love. He is the best example of what love is. And so if we want to love, if we want to be Christ-like, then we need to love the way He loves. As such, truth is critical. Truth is very, very important. It's pivotal if we hope to love like Christ. So we have to acknowledge and we have to apply the absolute, immutable, never-changing truths that uphold the universe. I love reading Proverbs because it talks about the fact that the truth predates the, the ground you're standing on. You know what I'm saying? That there are certain truths that just are, and societies come and go, and your feelings come and go, but truth, there are some truths that just are. And the more you understand those things and apply them, the better off your life is going to be. Amen? And if you want to find absolute truth, this is where you go. Right? This is God's Word. And I'm, this is me choosing not to launch into this whole study on why God's Word is so awesome. But uh, that's something we're going to do. So, again, we have to understand these, these absolute and immutable truths. But we also need, if we're really going to, where the rubber hits the road and we're, we're in, engaged in specific relationships, if we want to love like Christ, if we want to love best, we also have to take into account relative truths or ever-changing truths that are associated with our specific circumstances or the particular person we're trying to love. And so our pursuit of these relative truths have, has brought us to, it's helped us to recognize the value of books like Gary Chapman's Five Love Languages. Uh, I hope you have the book or you're planning to get it. I hope you've read it or you're planning to read it. Uh, if there are, this is just one of a series of books uh, there are is five love languages for teens. There's love languages for... There's just all sorts of different things. There's online tests you can take. Um, apparently, my love, my top two love languages are steak and maverick parts. But um, I wasn't expecting that, but, you know, you know, the test says what it says, right? But, um, so anyway, yeah, that's not true. So what were the love languages? There they are. Uh, yeah, steak and maverick, isn't it? Anyway, let's get on. Words of affirmation, you know, affirm. Kind, kind, nice words, quality time. Again, shut the phone off, plan some time, be with that person. Receiving gifts, again, you have to be specific to that person. Acts of service, what do they want, what do they need? And then physical touch, and again, sex is just a very small part of that. Non-sexual, uh, hugging people, you know, a pat on the back, sometimes, really, sometimes just a, a hand on the back can be the assurance that that individual needs. And so, we all need to be very aware of where we are and where others are, and that's basically what we're going to talk about today. We're, what we're going to do is we're going to, going to build on what we've discussed, and we're kind of asking the question right now. Sorry, all these things we've discussed, well, all right, what now? And what I'd like to do is just humbly suggest um, three challenges slash warnings um, that I believe are key in loving God and loving others best. First, let's talk about you. Everybody's favorite subject, right? <laughs> Sun Tzu said, if you know yourself and you know your enemy, then you need not fear a thousand battles. There's a lot said in that. If you don't know who Sun Tzu is, he wrote The Art of War, and it is one of the definitive textbooks on winning. I don't know about you, I like to win. And if you haven't figured out that a marriage is war, <laughs> if you haven't figured out that parenting is war, it is warfare. You are in the fight of your life. Get with it or get run over. Number two, but some of you might remember, uh, some, some of the older folks might not know this movie, but there was a movie that came out, and in it, uh, this guy on the screen, he was a professional driver, and, and uh, he got paid to get things from point A to point B. And so he's interacting with these bad guys, and he said, we want real drivers, you know, guys who would sell their abuelita, their grandma, to be behind the wheel. And he said, uh, all right, so what are we hauling? Because it was drugs and all this sort of thing, he was trying to get these bad guys. And he's like, you don't get to ask those questions. He said, 
you said you want real drivers. He said a real driver knows exactly what's in his car. And he made a very valid point there. Now why would I even bring that up? Well, because our first text today is Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23 that says, Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. In order for you... So my, my first challenge is this. Know yourself. Have you taken that love languages quiz yet? Do you know what you're, how you would prioritize those love languages? Have you just quickly, are, are you a dude who just said, yep, physical touch, that's me. Just You get that, we're good. That's ignorance. You need to read the book. All right? How are you going to keep your heart? And that keep can be like keeping a garden or keeping a fortress. How are you going to keep something if you're not paying attention to what's in there? If you're going to... If you're going to grow a garden, don't you kind of need to know what's in the garden? Right? What, 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 what's growing in there? And do things ever creep into the garden that don't belong? Yeah. And you need to know what's getting in there so you can keep the good stuff in and keep the bad stuff out. Same way if you're keeping a fortress. Like, gentlemen, I'm going to be beating on your toes all day today, so just get ready for it. Your home is your castle. And the people that are in your home are your responsibility. Whether you've abdicated your authority to your wife or the school or the government or whatever, it doesn't change any, any difference. In God's eyes, it's your responsibility. And how are you going to maintain and keep your castle if you can't even keep your own heart? You need to know yourself. You need to know what are my love languages. You need to know things like, what are my primary learning styles? And that's a whole nother series. Or, what is my primary leadership style? And what sort of learning, uh, what sort of teaching style, what sort of uh, leadership style do I tend to respond to or not respond to? These are things you need to know about yourself. Because if you don't, then you're, you're going to miss out. Important question is, what has God called you to be and build? I want you to read these scriptures. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and what? He shall give thee the desires of thy heart. Pause. That does not mean, if, well, I love God, so he's going to give me everything that I want. That is not what that verse says. If you delight yourself, if you want, if you like God, then he will give you what you want. He will give you the desire. Right? You ever find yourself saying, man, you know what I really want? I want everything to go away. And I want to be able to look at my car. I want to be able to play with my guns. I just want to be able to go hunt. I just want to be able to go do this. That's what I really want. And if the family and the, and the job and all that would just go away, ah, oh, this is what I really want. You are in for a world of pain. Because you could have that. You can throw your, you get rid of your wife, get, you know, send your kids away, you know, just ignore the church, ignore God, and you just go have your nice, shiny little thing. See how fulfilling that is. Or, you can delight yourself in the Lord. God, what have you called me to be? And I want to be that man. God, what have you called me to build? And I will be encouraged, I will be in, 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 enthused by the process of building it. Guys, the joy of taking one step. I don't, joy and happiness is progress. When you know you're growing, when you have that conversation with your wife, when you have that conversation with your kid, when you sail through that storm and you look around and they're all still there and they're better for it, there's no joy, there's no fulfillment like that. Amen. Set your sights on that. What has God called you to be? What has God called you to build? Commit thy way unto the Lord, trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. You want God on your side? Build his kingdom and not yours. Amen. Commit thy works unto the Lord, and thy thoughts shall be established. You know, it's amazing how if you want an excuse to not do right, you will always find it. Because your mind is weak, and it is bent in the wrong direction. If you do not establish your thoughts in the Lord then you, your wheels will start turning about the ways for you to get your own thing and do your own thing and build your own kingdom. And that's when God steps back and says, go for it, big boy. 
See what that see how that handles your marriage. See what your kids do with that. See if I don't just start messing with your career. You don't think God can do that? You go ahead and make your career an idol and say, God, I want this more than I want you. See what he does. Go for it. I can tell you from firsthand experience, that hurts. Amen. And we have a God that is all-powerful, and he can reach into your life in ways you can't imagine. The converse is also true. When you just say, okay, Lord, you bled and died on the cross for me, you're God. You're the creator, you're the savior, and you're the one that I'm going to stand before when I die. How about you just tell me what you want me to be, tell me what you want me to build, and I will be happy to do it. It's amazing what God can do with you. This will get you to prioritize what you need over what you want, or what you happen to feel at any particular moment. That's where you want to live. So, number one, know yourself. Know your love languages. Know your learning styles. Know how you respond. Number two, don't be spoiled. A, a scorner, it's a fool. It's someone who, not only is he ignorant, but even if he knows, he's not going to do right. A scorner loveth not one that reproveth. That means correct. Nobody likes to be corrected, right? Unless you're so focused on the mission that you're thankful for people who will tell you when you're wrong. Are you there yet? Am I awake? Do you appreciate those who love you enough to show up at your house and say the decision you have made is wrong and it's going to hurt you? Is that the kind of church you want? Is that the kind of pastor you want? Or do you want the kind of church and pastor or friends who will say, whoa, that, that's going to hurt. Love you. You're a good guy. Everything's good while you light a fire in your house. You know, have you ever seen that, like on TV, you know, like there's a fire? Like maybe the back of your shirt's on fire, the back of your hair's on fire? Looking good today, buddy, you're on fire. How about this one? Let's just make this simple. You got a booger on your face. Do you tell them or not? I do not understand someone who would be upset with someone for telling them that they have a boogie on their face. If I'm talking to you and I've got this giant... Here's a little Tagalog. Kulamuk on my face. Say, hey, you, you know, why don't you just fix that? You know what I mean? Don't look at me like, <coughs> while I'm trying to talk to you. What sort of life do you want to live? But I, really, there are some people who are like, I can't believe, I'm so embarrassed. I can't believe they did that. Really? You were embarrassed because they talked about it? Pay no attention to the fact that you're the one that walked in with the boogie on your face. All right? You need to think through this and make sure that you're not spoiled. Here's the thing. The more you learn about love languages, the more you will be aware of what your preferences are. When you, the more you learn about love languages, the more you learn about learning styles. How many of you have read The Laws of Learner? You might know what you're talking about. Different learning styles. Okay, well, there's another series. You might know different leadership styles. All right, those are some things that you read. That There are different ways that... So, learning style. Lecture versus let's build something together. Tactical or tactile learning. Or there's a bunch of different things. And if you don't know yourself, then someone's going to be trying to love you or lead you or teach you, and all you are hearing is annoyance. Right? And so you're going to miss out on a whole bunch. But conversely, if you know the love languages, and you know the different learning styles, if you're not careful, you'll be spoiled and you'll say, well, they must not have read the love languages because if they had, then they would clearly know that quality time is my love language. And here they have brought this gift before me. I cannot accept it. They're not communicating love in my favorite. And so I... We'll reject that. That's you being spoiled. And if you do that, what's going to happen is you are going to miss out on the vast majority of the love and the leadership and the learning that God is trying to bring into your life if you're spoiled. 
If it's got to be your favorite, if it's got to be dialed specifically dialed into your preferences in order for you to listen, you're going to miss out on a whole bunch. Yes? Yes. So, and, and here's something else you need to understand. Sometimes, if you're spoiled, you'll be waiting for love to come to you. And love is saying, come to me. You'll be waiting for that teacher to come to your level, to teach you. And that teacher saying, come to me. You'll be waiting for that leader to explain it and inspire you in the way that is dialed into your preferences. And that leader is saying, come to me. And if you refuse, if you're, gonna, if you're sitting around waiting in life for people to love you, teach you, and lead you in your favorite, you're going to miss out. You're going to get left behind. So we've talked about you. Now let's talk about your family. The first thing, it's, the same, it's really not complicated. Our first two points were, know yourself, don't be spoiled. Got it? Know yourself, don't be spoiled. Next, uh, know your family. You know, 1 Peter 3, 7 talks about dwelling with your wife according to knowledge. All right, that's important. Luke chapter 14, verse 28, and I'm kind of using this in a different way than it normally gets worked. It's talking about in over, overall counting the cost of discipleship, of following Christ. But obviously within the umbrella of following Christ, leading and loving your family, amen? And so it says, which of you intending to build a tower sitteth not down first and counteth the cost? What is this going to take, whether you have sufficient to finish it? You need to know your family's love languages. If, you have, if you've gotten this far and you haven't had a conversation with your wife about what her love languages are, you know, I'm not saying, I'm just saying, you're an idiot. Okay? I've already explained to you that it's very likely that you're spending time, you're spending money, you're spending effort, you're, you're trying affection, you're trying all these different things. If you don't understand how she prioritizes the love languages in this particular season of life, then you're wasting your time and you're pouring love into a tank full of holes. Learn how she needs to, and how she can recognize and perceive love. You need to know your wife. Gentlemen, you need to be the authority on her before you can be the authority over her. If someone else knows your wife better than you, shame on you. You are one flesh with her. You ought to be the authority on who she is, what she needs. And again, this is incredibly convicting to me. But you need to be the authority on her before you're the authority over her. Know her love languages. Know your kids' love languages. And if you are still from this mentality that, well, I just do what I do, and I'm fair, and I treat everybody the same. If you, if you still think that parenting that way is going to work, congratulations, you're destroying your kid. Because you're lazy. Because you're more interested in life being your way than winning. And it's, it's just wrong. There's just no two ways about it. It's wrong. And you're failing. Stop. I know. Feeling bad is only as valuable as it serves to help you get better. Alright? I'm not trying to make you feel bad. I'm trying to get you determined. I'm trying to light a fire under your derriere to start learning. Start paying attention. Rather than be frustrated and just have an emotion, I'm angry and she's angry and my, what's wrong with my family? Gentlemen, let's start asking some questions. Let's start having some conversations. Let's start aiming a little better. And learning what works and learning what doesn't work. Not just with your wife, not just with your husband, ladies, but with every single one of your kids. This is work. This is what it takes. You need to know them. 
You've seen that, right? <coughs> we love that verse. Joshua 24, 15. As for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. And if I were to ask you, can you amen that? Yes. Gentlemen, we, re we watch movies like Courageous. Where are you men of courage? Can you stand and say, me and my family? All that kind of big talk without doing the work. You're fooling yourself. And that's why it drives me nuts, guys. I, 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 as a, there's a lot of things I don't do right. But as a pastor, I try to pay attention. And when I see some man going, hey, man, where's me in my house? And I see the wife go, oh. I see the kids, the son with this blank stare. I know that somebody's not putting in the work. Someone's not asking the questions. Someone's not aiming. They're shooting arrows, but they're not hitting the mark. Because they've not put in the time, they've not put in the work to get it dialed in. And so, if you want to stand before God and say, as for me and my house, Lord, we're going to serve you, then you need to put in the work. Ladies, you can help him or you can convince him that he's wasting his time because he married you. Young people, you can convince your parents that working hard to listen to you and understand what you need and how you need it will work because you respond. Or you can convince your parents that it doesn't matter if they pay attention to your love language. It doesn't matter if they pay attention to the way you learn because you're just not going to do it anyway. And then they're going to say, okay, why should I put in all this hard work if you're just not going to pay attention? You're grounded. Or I'm just going to give it to you how it's easiest for me, and you'll either take it or leave it. You see what I'm saying? So I'm hammering on the men in here today, but ladies, young people, understand how, ladies, you're pivotal. If, if, if he didn't need a wife, God wouldn't have given him a wife. He, that word need is very important, okay? So, Guys, this needs to be the priority in your home. Who has God called your wife to be? You're supposed to be keeping your house. You're supposed to be keeping your heart and keeping your castle. How are you supposed to do that if you have no clue what God has called your wife to be? If you don't know what God has called you to be and what God has called your wife to be, how on earth are you going to help your kids discover what God has called them to be? It's time to step up. So, know them. And then, don't let them be spoiled. Because just like you, if their knowledge of the love languages, if their understanding of learning styles and leadership styles causes them to ignore or reject love, leadership, wisdom, that is not communicated in a style that is dialed into their preferences, then they're going to miss out. Listen your wife, your children, will miss out on the vast majority of the love and the wisdom and the leadership that God is bringing into their life. Don't allow them to be spoiled. A virtuous woman is a crown to her husband, but she that maketh ashamed is as rottenness in his bones. If you're thinking, Pastor, this is good talk, but good grief. I'm not doing this. It's too much work. Okay. You go work your, work your little tail off. I don't know about you. If Mama ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. I could have all the stuff in the world. If I didn't have, if my relationship with Annie isn't right, it doesn't matter. Conversely, if Annie and I are right, you know, the house and the, the cars and the, all the other stuff. And I'm being honest, yeah, that's, that's hard. Same way, what would you give? What would you give up today if you knew that to make this decision today will result in my son being who he's supposed to be? You see, 
He that wasteth his father and chaseth away his mother, young people, I'm talking to you, is a son that causes shame and bringeth reproach. What has God called you to be? What has God called you to build? Well, we don't know. By the way, we're going to be spending a lot of time talking about that this year at church. Like, as a church, we're going to decide. And we're going to talk about it, and we're going to put this into a, a plan. What has God called you to be? What has God called you to build? What's the best way to do it? If you don't think that the love languages have anything to do with the best way to get that to happen, you need to catch up. If you allow them to be spoiled, if you allow your kid to say, they've obviously never read the love languages, they have no, that teacher has pro obviously never read the laws of the learner because they are just giving no thought to my particular learning style. Tell me you're not doing that. Tell me your kid doesn't bring home a bad grade and you blame the teacher. Tell me you're not doing that. Tell me that you have the wisdom to look at your kid and say, suck it up. Your job is to get the grade. And we're not blaming the teacher. Because you're going to go into the workforce, you're going to go into the military, you're going to have relationships, and they're not going to care about your leadership style or your learning style or what you want. They're not, you're going to fold your arms and say, you come to me. And they're saying, you come here. God himself is go requires you to come to him. The boss isn't going to come to you. The boss is going to say, you come here. When they get into the college level, yes, thank God for teachers. Uh, and there's so many great teachers who work so hard to come to where children are. Amen? But I'm going to tell you, you get to the college level, <laughs> you get to the workplace, and there is a standard. Come up here or get lost. And if you're teaching your kids now, by having those husband-wife conversations, well, that teacher, obviously, blah, blah, blah. Well, that pastor, that Sunday school teacher, they're just, just not getting it done. Tell your kid to suck it up. Sit down with your kid and say, look, there is love there. There is learning to be had there. There is leadership to be had there. Are you going to be smart enough to go grab it and digest it? If you're not doing that, there's a, there's a phrase, it's called shooting yourself in the foot. Or you can go ahead and shoot your kid in the foot. See how well they walk their walk after that. In Luke chapter 16, verse 27 through 29, we, and I've got to do this very quickly. It's one of the most terrifying portions of the Word of God. A man, the Bible is telling us a story of a man that actually died and was in hell. And in hell you get some clarity. And what he was begging for Please send someone to my family so that they don't have to come to this place. He wanted, he wanted God to raise someone from the dead so that his brothers would see and believe. And the answer was, they have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. Basically the answer was, they have the exact same opportunity that you have. And they have the same responsibility to hear and receive that you had. What's all this about? Why am I bringing this up? Because this isn't just about them getting a good grade or getting a good job. Your child's eternal destiny very much hangs in the balance of how well you listen and apply what we're talking about. If your kid can't receive love from a human being, what is the likelihood that they're going to receive God for, uh, love from a God that they can't see? This is, a, this is about as big a deal as it gets. You need to be asking yourself the question, are, is my family, does my family have the wisdom to see where God, through people, is reaching out to love and teach and lead them? Or are they... This isn't very fun. They're not speaking my language. If that's what you've got going on, then the world's going to pass them by. And you and they will just keep blaming everybody else. 
So, we have discussed your family. We've discussed you. Now let's talk about our neighbors in this no time that we have remaining. So, number one, when it comes to your neighbors, know that they're already spoiled. All right, understand that. We live in a nation that's spoiled. We want it our way, right away, and the Bible said that this was going to happen. Okay? So, Jesus said, I'm the bread of life. All right? He performed miracles. Some of the miracles that he performed was, remember, the fish and the bread? And the people came to him in John chapter 6, and they said, What uh, sort of sign are you going to do so that we know you're the Messiah? Uh, how about you do that bread thing again? And he said, I'm the bread of life. And they said, come on, we want, we want the bread. Do the bread thing. And Jesus said, I'm the bread. And they were like, well, you took the bread. That's what his own people did. So what should we expect our neighbors to do? Well, show us the pizzazz. Let's, let's see it. And we say, well, it's, it's hard work and it's discipline. It's acknowledging Christ, repenting of our sin and doing right. How do we respond? You respond exactly the way Jesus did. You just try. You do your best anyway. But there's something to learn here. Tony Robbins, who's a very famous uh, uh, leader, coach, and the reason why he's very famous is because he gets results. He gets people to do things where... Decades of therapy fail. And where the church fails, by the way. And he said something. He says, we talk about style versus substance. And he said, style is more important at first. And when he said that, I was like, what? And, I, and so I asked, is this true? He's just a man. Does he know what he's talking about? And then there's this. The reason why he's, he's true, it's true is because he's simply reiterating this. Under the Jews I became as a Jew that I might gain the Jews. So that they are as... That they are under the law, as under the law. That I might gain them that are under the law. To them that are without law, as without law. Being not without law of God, but the law of Christ. That I might gain them that are without the law. To the weak became I as weak, that I might gain the weak. I am made all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. What's that saying? Style is more important at first. If you and I... And, and think about this one, all right? Jesus said, follow me, right? Follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. Where was he standing when he said that? On the shore to fishermen. Jesus came to earth. Then he went to where they were. And then he said, follow me. Does that make sense? If you and I, as a group of Christians have this mentality that if you can't just recognize how wise and how loving and how amazing we are, well then you just are the world, you stay out there. And guess what's going to happen? You're going to go out of business. This is a church in Detroit. You think they spent any money on their programs? I, this picture does not do its service. That is an absolutely gorgeous cathedral. It's beautiful. Or it was. You think they had a worship program? Think they had Sunday school classes? Yeah, but at some point, these churches started decide deciding, if you won't come to us, then that's your problem. Folks, if we want to stay in business as a church, we're going to have to go to where people are. And I don't mean just physically. I mean mentally, emotionally. Socially. And this is going to take us in places that we can't even imagine yet. It's hard. It's work. And some of you aren't ever going to be on board with it. Because this it takes us in to the left, it takes us to the right, up, down, all sorts of different maturity levels. It's so difficult. It's incredibly complicated. Which is why it takes all of us. But we can do it. God certainly stands ready to use us. And by the way, if we don't do it, if you and I don't, don't be, choose not to be the church here in New Washington, people will just go somewhere else. But what do you think is going to happen to this community?
there's a balance. In your relationship with God, He's going to reach out to you, you have to reach out to Him. There's a two-way street, yes? In your relationship with your kids, it's the same thing. Teach them to be smart enough to take God's hand when He reaches. And that's our job as a, as a church. We are to be the eyes and ears, the hands and feet of God, and do our best to reach out to people. But at the end of the day, they've got to reach back. People need to know that like Jesus, we are willing to come to where they are. But they must follow Jesus. And following Jesus does not lead to them getting their way right away every day. It's about God getting His way right away every day. It's about eyes closed. This sermon is simple. Know yourself. Don't be spoiled. Know your